Wonderful cafeteria today. How are you guys doing? Good to see you, Whitewater. Uh, if you're new here, I just want to make sure you feel welcome. Um, this is actually kind of different. Um, I act, we actually usually meet up in this big auditorium, and it's got like a big stage, and it's super old and kind of cool. And then we're in the cafeteria today because the school is having, a, uh, I think, a big play going on this, this weekend. And uh, someone came in, and they said, oh, man, I'm going to have to get to know somebody today. <laughs> And I was like, yes, I'm so glad. Um, so I'm really glad that we're all packed in. Some of you guys might, you know, be, you know, trying to control your elbows. Some of you guys might be having a, a silent panic attack. If you do, just raise your hand. We'll have someone come and help you. Um, or maybe it's Holy Spirit. Just keep it going like this. I don't know. Um, anyways, I just want to make sure you feel welcome. So glad to be here with you. I'm a kind of on the other side of a cold. So if I sound like I'm all of a sudden, like my voice is changing, I'm hitting puberty. Uh, I don't think that's the case. I think it's from the cold. But great to see you. One of the things I think that makes Whitewater really unique, the thing that just makes me love it here, um, is that we're not, we don't ask the question, um, who's in, who's out? You ever been in a, a community, maybe a community of faith or political party or maybe a classroom where people were always asking the question, who's in, who's out? Who's the popular kid? Who's the, who's the unpopular kid? Who's the skaters? Who's the stoners? Who's the you know, the preps, who's in this group and who's out. You ever been involved with anything like that or experienced that? The worst is if you're not in, right? If you're in, then everything's cool and your job's to keep, you know, the the people who shouldn't be in, you got to keep them out. Um, But I love that that's not what we're about here because we really take our lead from the life of Jesus. Not a lot of religious institution, the life of Jesus. When you look at his life, his life was about a much bigger question. His question was like, it was so radical for his day, but it was, it was this question, who's moving towards God and who's moving away? Because he loved the people who were moving toward him, but the cool thing was the ones who were moving away from him, he loved them just as much. See, so what happens when we ask the question, who's in, who's out? We, you can create a culture accidentally where we love and treat with um, special interest the people who are on the inside, but we do not love those on the outside. And I love that that we realize here that everyone's on a journey. And it doesn't matter where you're at, it matters where you're headed. And uh, so we feel one of our cool um, responsibilities is, as a leader here and just a, a regular person at Whitewater is to help people move forward on their spiritual journey. It's going to look different for different people. And I want you to know that uh, up front. That's what we are all about. I'm going to pray and then we're going to jump into a, a conversation uh, that, I, that I think is, for me is, has been radically challenging this week, and it's something that radically <laughs> challenges me in my faith um, as I've been walking with Christ. So let me pray, and we'll jump into that. Father God, I just thank you for today. Thank you for those who are gathered here. I thank you that you've brought us here in this cafeteria as we're packed in close, Lord, um, as we experience groovy music, as we hopefully experience times to, to worship you, God. I pray that you would work on our hearts today that you would challenge us, that we would allow you to challenge us, Lord, that we would allow you to encourage us, that we would connect with one another, that we'd leave here changed. We pray these things in your name. Amen. You guys with me so far? All right, good. There's at least one. Um, um, I'll never forget a conversation I had with a friend of mine. We were talking about um, our families, and I was telling a story about my family, and... um, I just told him, you know, there was one time we were talking about, you know, parents who, parents gone wild, parents who do crazy things. I was like, yeah, my dad one time flipped out, and he slammed the door one time so hard that it broke, like, part of the door, and it it fell, and he's like, oh, that's not that big a deal. I was like, yeah, but my dad was a pastor. You know, he's like, ooh, that's really bad, you know. And and he he had yelled, and, like, I I was terrified. How many of you guys remember being, like, four and, and... like some male figure in your life that you respected yelling and how terrifying that was, right? It's like a big grizzly bear, and it's, it's frightening. I remember just being terrified and felt like I had done something terribly wrong. And I remember my, my dad came back a, a few hours later, and, and he, I was in my room and, you know, hiding. 
And he, he came in, and he, he sat down on the bed, and he had me sit next to him, and he just said, you know, son, I, I, I just want you to know that I was totally wrong to get that angry. And I, I, want, I want to apologize to you. I'm so sorry. Will you forgive me? And, um, you know, I, it kind of went from this, you know, gripe fest about, you know, parents and into this moment for me. Whoa, there we go. This moment for me that had extreme meaning. And I remember looking at my friend, and I remember this moment. He, he I don't know if it was tears, but there was some depth of emotion that was there. Because when he, he, he spoke up and he said, I, 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 never, I never experienced that. My, my mom was always in the TV. My mom, my dad would n- never do that. My, my mom would, would give me stuff to buy me off. My dad would get angry at her and yell and scream and then go and then watch TV and be in the entertainment room. And it was a totally different experience growing up. Never had that time of reconciliation there was like a pride or it was okay to be angry and that's, that's just how things are. And um, there was a disconnect. And uh, when I heard that, it just made me, it made me grieve. I was like, man, I didn't, re-. sometimes you don't realize how the good things that you have, how good they are and how rough they are. And I know there's people here that maybe have been in a situation like I, I did and were lucky enough to grow up with parents or a father figure or mother figure who really loved and would reconcile and figure things out and work through and, and that was like, my dad humbled himself. I'm just like a four-year-old. He comes and apologizes. That blew this guy away. There's n- this guy, he said that um, he knew that his, that his parents were no good, uh, especially his mom, when he, um, he could do whatever he wanted to do, and they didn't care. And he knew they didn't really love him. And, you know, he wanted all the freedom and to be able to go do this and do that with his life and his body and his mind and but he, but he also knew in his heart that they didn't care about him because the more he would do that, the more he was really crying out to them to, to say something, to do something, to grab a hold of him and show that they cared. And, and not just in some like, you know, nice way, like with a nice little card or, you know, for Christmas or a nice toy or a new cell phone or a new gadget or a new thing that we could all distract ourselves with. And he wanted, what he wanted was them to say, no, like you're worth more than that. I'm not, I don't want to let you do that. You know what I'm saying? And we live in a, a culture with a lot of elephants. We live in homes with a lot of elephants. We've been talking about elephants in the room. We had a big pink one here earlier. We handed out these little elephants. I think I got one in my back pocket. Um, these little babies right here. And uh, elephants, elephants in the room. What, we, what we've been discovering, what we've been talking about with, with elephants is just this concept that um, elephants are really a large issue that everyone is acutely aware of, but no one wants to talk about. You got any of those in your family? You got any of those in your life? We've been discovering those. We've been going through the different rooms of our, of our lives. We went through the kitchen. That was like the first room we went through, and that's the idea that we like, we're super disconnected. We're all busy, and like, we don't even take time to sit and eat and talk and be together. Last night, I was with my uh, family, and my brother-in-law's in town, and my, my brother was texting me, and he, he had some stuff going on, and so I started texting him back. I realized it was taking me out of being present with my family, and it happens like that, you know? So, I, like, I have elephants in my life. We talked about even secret ones, you know, like the closet, you know, addictions, or this, this thing that only you know about, or this person knows about that they did to you. And it's not, maybe the elephant's not even your fault. Maybe it's been a, something that happened to you, and something was taken from you. And we've been talking about real things. And uh, today, I wanted to talk about the large issue that you might know about, or maybe you don't, but everybody else that knows you and loves you knows about, and, but no one wants to say anything about. And I really want to talk about uh, the elephant in the entertainment room. When I say that, I, what I'm talking about with that is the entertainment room can be a literal room uh, that has the TV, and it has all our DVDs, or if you're like a Netflix or Apple TV person, maybe you've got all your, your movies digital, you know, you're like one of the cool people and you got that, or maybe it's all your football, ESPN, and that's where you spend a ton of your time when you're not, like, working, and then uh, paying the bills, taking care of what needs to be taken care of, putting the kids to bed, getting to watch your ESPN, getting to watch your movie, getting to watch your thing, get, or on, on the uh, computer. Entertainment rooms on the computer a lot of times for people. You know, getting on Facebook, if you've got the laptop, you're sitting in your, 
in your couch and maybe your husband or wife's watching TV, watching some kind of home improvement show or whatever it is for you, and you're like nice and snug and cozy, and you're on Facebook for a few hours. Then you go to bed and you get your phone out. How many of you guys do this? And you do like the, the Facebook phone swipe before you go to bed. Are there any people that, that do that? Am I the only one? My wife the only one? Yeah, well, I'm going to stop talking now. Um, there's this, this, this elephant that we have uh, with, with inter- the entertainment room. And what it does is it distracts us and we're disconnected people. Uh, here's some stats. I gave these a few weeks ago. But um, they, they did a study with uh, uh, married couples and they wanted to know how much face-to-face like connection time they had. Guess what they found? <laughs> Actually, that would be really good. No, I'm just kidding. It's not that bad. <laughs> 26 minutes a week. So some math person can divide that in their head into the seven uh, days. It's not good. I know that. It's not good. Um, Kids, um, the average child, when they come home, will watch three to five hours of TV. Not connecting with, it was like zoning out. Like we we are disconnected people, but here's the problem. The entertainment room is even worse. What's, What's going on is not that we're just disconnected, we need to connect. And we talked about that a few weeks ago, how important that is, that question that we all ask, like, do you love me? Your kids are asking that question. Like, mom, dad, do you love me? They might not be saying it in their heart of hearts that that's maybe what their actions are saying. Or that maybe that's what their actions aren't saying that are really saying, do you love me? The, the thing that's really going on underneath all this stuff, the laptops, the flat screens, the DVDs, the movies, the, the sports coverage, um, the lack of connection, the Facebook, the texting, the being there but not being present, what's really going on in your family <clears throat> and in your life is this, <clears throat> excuse me, with your kids, what you're really saying when you let them just zone out for hours and hours or when you zone out for hours and hours, you're not just saying, hey, I'm going to disconnect w- with you. You're also saying, hey, culture, hey, Facebook, Hey, creep on the other end of that Facebook page that you don't really know who they are. Um, uh, the glamour magazines, all the things that they can read. Hey, world and culture, you raise my kids. You lead my kids. We don't know this, but the real elephant in the room, the real elephant in the entertainment room, or the entertainment room of life, is that we're abandoning leadership. And the reality is you might have checked out and you might have stopped leading, you might have stopped directing, you might have stopped loving because leadership is loving first and then leading, right? You always do both, but leadership is loving. And you might have checked out, but guess what? There's a million different sites on the internet. There's a million different people. There's a million different voices that have not checked out and they're stepping into the room to lead your kids, to lead your wife, to lead you and without you even knowing it. And you might be someone here and you're like, I don't have kids, so it doesn't really matter. But you had parents, and some of you might be that person who experienced the abandoning of leadership by your family. Are there a few people in here? Like, this is a serious thing to me. This is really, really, I wanted to be, like, fun and, like, bring, like, this, we're in a cafeteria, but then the more I was, like, looking at this, I was just so challenged. Um... I want us to face the truth here. I was talking with one guy last week. His name's Jason. He's super funny. And he helps out here. And he told me, oh, thank you so much, ma'am. <laughs> oh, sure, thank you. Do I need it? No. <laughs> Have you ever let, oh, you guys are probably sitting there being like, I wish he would just like clear his throat. <laughs> I've been that person before too. Um, yeah, we were talking. He said, you know, I was thinking back when I was a kid. And uh, I'm, I'm like watching my kids now. He's like, I remember when I was their age, his, his kids are like, you know, probably five and, and three. And uh, I, went, I don't let them out of my sight. He's like, when I was a kid, I don't think I was ever in the sight of my parents. Like me and my brother, when we were like six, we, we went and gathered a bunch of wood and a bunch of, you know, wood chips and, you know, branches. And we put up this big old pile outside of this barn, about, you know, five feet from the barn. And it was this huge pyre. And then we went and got gasoline. I was like, Jason, is this story going where I think it's going? He's like, oh, yeah. He's like, dude, we, we, it was like a Roman candle in the back. I mean, it was just huge, and this fire was so big, and it was crackling. I mean, he, he said that they, they put gasoline 
And while his brother was like putting the gasoline on, he took the match and just threw it. He's like, I don't know where my dad was. We thought it was the coolest. Now I look back at that, I was like, that was terrible. My dad came back and gave us a whooping, though, because we almost burned down his barn. I was like, yeah, yeah, that'll happen. (laughs) But many of us have experienced the, the abandonment of leadership in our lives, have we not? Leadership, my, in my opinion, and I'm coming from a Christian perspective, and I know there's people who aren't there yet, and that's okay. Um, but leadership, in my opinion, is helping someone have the faith to step into what God has planned for them, what God is calling them into. Not making them become me, not making them like fit into my box, into my life, and to become like my gifts and my weaknesses, but to help them flourish I have to help them have the faith to step into the things God has planned for them. Can we can you dig that? It's it's so important, you guys. That's leadership. And when we abandon it, we don't even realize it because we got the phones and we got the TVs and we got this, we never connect and we never talk and we never step into the moments where our kids are crying out saying, Hey, do you love me? Do you love me? Do you love me when they're getting farther and farther away? And there's more and more of a gap. And uh, I know uh, dads and moms, I've seen them who just, they don't know how to bridge it. They don't have communication skills. And their parents didn't teach them this. So they just let it get farther and farther and farther away. And pretty soon, all of a sudden, you know, the, the, the stuff on the internet, like, like the, how you should look, the, what, the standard of beauty, the, the leadership is stepping into their life, your kid's life. Or maybe he has already stepped into your life and culture says this, was, this is what's beautiful. This is uh, what makes you valuable. Uh, and then, the, you know, all of a sudden, pornography or something s- steps in and says, hey, this is what love is. This is what, this is what the standard is in our culture. Um, this is how we, we treat each other. Um, I can tell you, I do not want to someday look back and realize, man, I allowed some 16-year-old boy to teach my daughter when she's someday in high school what love is. I, I just... And I, I, I can't stand the thought of that. I can't stand the thought of not being there, helping my daughter learn to be the best that she can be as, as she is, who she is, to f- have the faith to follow God's plan for her life. There's a story I want us to look at. It's in um, the book of Judges. It's an Old Testament story. And um, it's not super long, but I, I think it has some valuable lessons for us. Because we've, we've been talking about, okay, here, what's the elephant in the room? Well, it's, pe- it's us abandoning leadership. It's us not stepping into the moments that God has for us to sp- speak or to love and to demonstrate uh, God to other people. And um, there's this story that I think gives us real, key- real keys to how we, how we reverse that, how we can change that, how we can help people move towards God, not just toward ourselves, Not towards some selfish vision that we might want for our lives, but towards what God has for them. And um, it starts off in uh, chapter 2 of the book of Judges, Judges, and it's about this guy named Joshua. Joshua is this guy who's been the leader of Israel. He's been this leader of this nation. And he's about to die. He's about to die. And he's old. And his story is really important before we jump into this one. So the backstory is this. There is a leader named Moses that God called to set... God's people free from Egypt. You guys know the story, right? And then Moses steps into that moment. He was, he was totally afraid. He didn't want to lead. He didn't want to step in. He was like, no, God, use someone else. Use my brother-in-law. Use, use anyone else but me. But God's like, no, I want to use you. There's this call to lead. It's weird when you step into faith. Sometimes we always look at people up, you know, up front, the ones who are leading you know, worship, or the, uh, some leader that maybe impacted our life. We're like, that's the leader. Well, God calls us to lead. He calls us to lead. And um, that's one of the hard things to step into. But Moses did. And he led people out of Egypt. Remember, they crossed the Red Sea. There's this moment where Pharaoh's army was just crushing down on them. And uh, the, the waters part. And in faith, they walk across and God saves them. And then they wander around in the desert for a while. They take a lot longer than it should take to get to the promised land. And during that journey, there, that generation of, of of people, they had really big wins of following God, and they also had some major losses. They made some really bad mistakes, and, and uh, so God says, hey, look, I need you to choose a successor. I need you to choose 
a person, a man to invest in. And the man I want you to invest in is Joshua. And so Moses gets this guy that he's supposed to pour everything into so that this guy, Joshua, can lead the people into the land. And Moses is like, but I wanted to lead them into the land. I was going to, I was going to do that. I let them out of slavery. I want to lead them into something other than a desert. God says, it's not your job anymore. You need to pour into this guy. That's going to be his generation's job. And then Joshua has this mentor who pours into his life and radically transforms him and gives him the confidence and gives him the, the vision for what he can be and then empowers him and he goes and does it and he takes the people of Israel and the new generation and they step in to the promised land and there's this moment that they have that's just like the exodus when they stepped across the Red Sea. There's a moment where they come to the Jordan River and God says, okay, it's your turn to have faith. I want you to put your foot into it though. It's not going to part until you put your foot into it. So they go, some guys put their foot into the river and it parts. Isn't that true about faith that sometimes we have to act first in faith to see God move? That's the scary part about faith, right? And Joshua learned that from who? Moses. And then he steps through and they take the land. And that's where we pick up. Check this out. This is really fascinating story about generations. After Joshua sent the people away, each of the tribes left to take possession of the land allotted to them. And the Israelites served the Lord throughout the lifetime of Joshua and the leaders who outlived him. Those who had seen all the great things the Lord had done for Israel. So they, Joshua's generation, good or bad? They were pretty good. Josh, Josh, they were like following the Lord. They did great stuff. They served him. They saw God do mighty things. It was like, wow. Joshua, son of Nun, the servant of the Lord, died at the age of 110. That's a pretty good life, I'd say. They buried him in the land. He had been allocated at uh, uh, Timnath and Serah in the hill country of Ephraim, north of the mountain of Gash. You guys know where that is, I'm sure, so I don't have to go into it. <laughs> Just across the street. After that generation died, now listen up, don't miss this. In verse 10 it says, after that generation died, another generation grew up who did not acknowledge the Lord or remember the mighty things that he, that he had done for Israel. Let me read that again. After that generation died, after Joshua's generation that had followed and taken risks and led well, after they had passed away, the next generation grew up not acknowledging or not knowing God or remembering the mighty things that God had done for Israel. That's a fairly important thing, wouldn't you think? Like if God like parted the sea two times and did some miraculous things to free you from, from slavery, free you from this life that, that, that you couldn't get away from yourself, that God had come and done it. And God led them by like fire at night. God led them by a cloud of smoke during the day. Like God was present with them as they wandered through the desert. Like this crazy journey, this spiritual journey. God had done all these things. You think it'd be really important to pass those memories down, wouldn't you? But somehow it didn't. In verse 11, here's the results. The Israelites did evil in the, in the uh, Lord's sight. And served the images of Baal, and they abandoned the Lord, the God of their ancestors who brought them out of Egypt. They went after other gods, worshiping gods of people around them, and they angered the Lord. And they abandoned the Lord to, to serve Baal and the image of the Ashtoreth. And just so you know, like, we can think, like, oh, well, you know, freedom of religion, going, checking out different religions, and all religions are equal. Um, I would submit that that's probably not totally true. Um, the, the ones who serve the Baal gods... You had to hurt and cut and make yourself bleed um, to merit their love and their power. So if you wanted to get them to do something, bail to do something for you, you had to like cut yourself and hurt yourself. And there was this self-mutilation. Um, when they would worship the Ashtoreth and uh, some other gods like that, they would actually have to sacrifice their, their babies. This is not like, a oh, all religions are equal. And like the Yahweh God that these Israelites are serving is like those gods. Not at all. Can't kid ourselves. And, they, and these kids grew up, like, seeing that, like, that was, like, their Facebook. That was their thing. I'm not saying Facebook's bad. I'm not saying cell phones are bad. You, you guys hear me? There's a difference. It, but if we let them consume us, it can lead to a bad place. You guys feel me on that, yeah? So um, in this story, all of a sudden, the, the Baal gods and the self-mutilation, and there were these weird sexual rites that they would do, and this, right, it was the, the equivalent of pornography today. 
the equivalent of you know some terrible sexual addiction stuff, the equivalent of uh, infanticide was happening to Joshua's kids, to these people. I'm just imagine your kids going off and doing the worst, most harmful things to themselves that are just it's self destructive. They were destroying themselves. Wasn't that, I'm not trying to read this and say, man, well, man, these people shouldn't have a freedom to, to believe what they want to believe or whatever, you know. Well, I'm saying if you love people, you don't want to see them destroy themselves. You don't want to see them step into something that destroys everything, every fiber of what you know is good about them and about their future. You don't want to see someone get addicted to meth and see 10 years later the, the havoc and the, the devastation it's caused in their life and in their body. You don't want to see that. You don't want to see someone who's had to enter into prostitution or enter into uh, the porn industry and have their life completely changed. You don't want to see that. And as we tell that, this is a, this is a story of heartache. What went wrong? Moses was a great leader. Joshua was this supposed great leader. But then the generation afterward faced destruction. So there's three things I think we can really pick up from this. So that doesn't happen. happen. So we don't abandon leadership. And the first is, who's the person that you're pouring into? Who's the person that's poured into you? Moses poured into Joshua's life, yeah? Who did Joshua pour into? I don't read anyone like that, that, that they say, hey, this leader Joshua raised up, or this group of leaders, and Joshua poured into their life, taught them all the things that he had learned, and, and, and said, hey, I'm just giving you this as a guide. You have to go, and you have to make a life on your own. I want you to have faith on your own. I want you to know that you, you can do this, but I want to give you every tool that I've, I've picked up along the way. There was none of that. How many, let me ask a question. How many of you guys can look back, wherever you're at in your spiritual journey, but can look back and say, Man, there was a key person, a providential person that stepped into my life, that changed my life. If they hadn't stepped into my life, I would not be where I am today. There's some people here that you can look back. God uses people in our lives. Sometimes that person, uh, it can be an awful providential person that can make us turn the wrong way too, right? That's the power that leadership has. You can like, it it can turn you into this, thing you never wanted to be, the thing you hated you become, or the leadership of love can can empower you to become what you never thought you could be. And we need to know with our families and with the elephant in the room of abandoning leadership and saying, oh, you can raise my daughter world or dads and families down the street because I never spend time with my kids. You raise my kids or, you know, world, you love my wife or you love my husband because I'm busy. That, that will destroy us. That's, you want to see where that leads? We've seen it. I mean, history does repeat at times. We need to learn from the past. We need to learn what God has, I think, in his heart for us. And one of the big ones is having providential people in our lives, people that pour into us, people that you pour into. And if you've got family, one of your first ministries is your kids. We want to see the best for them. We want to see the best happen to them. The next piece that's connected to that is when you, when you are pouring into someone, a few things happen. They start to pick up who you are. <clears throat> the world and young people, and I'm, I'm saying, I'm going to say myself, because I've got a lot of uh, guys who pour into me. What I don't want, what the younger generation doesn't want and doesn't need is people who just tell them what you ought to do and this is what you should have done. And this is how you messed up. You know this kind of thing? That's not, that's not, what, they, that's not what I'm talking about with a mentor. That's going to have about as much influence as, as, uh, as they will until they stop wagging their finger and then they go away. And it's like, oh, good, they're out of my life. I don't have to worry about them anymore. I will forget whatever they said because it irritated me. <laughs> we don't need people just telling us what to do. We need someone modeling what to do. We need someone modeling how to live how to be a man, how to love someone, how to treat your neighbors, how to treat um, situations that arise, how to prioritize my life. Have you ever uh, struggled with your priorities and say, this is the main thing, these are the most important things to me, and you have a list, but then when you look at your life, everything that's the least important is at the top? 
And like things like if your relationship's important with God is important to you, you're like you're never at, at church, you're never connecting with people who help you love Jesus more, you're never getting into the word, you're never, like you're not, you say it's a priority because over here it is, but in your, what does your life say? Or how, you, how we raise our kids, like our, our, the, our priorities, what do they say to our kids? Well, I, I grew up, I love sports and big, big into sports, but I loved that my family said, look, you can do sports, we're gonna, we're gonna go for it, but sports aren't gonna be everything because someday sports are gonna be gone. We don't want that to just define you. And I was really good at soccer. I was really good at football. I made a select team and, and we looked at the schedule and it meant I was gonna be gone every weekend for the year. And my mom was like, you know what? I love you too much to do that. And I'm not saying sports are bad. I was able to, to do sports in college. I was, able, I was fine. It, wasn't, it didn't inhibit me from being able to do sports. It just said, you're not just, your God isn't going to be soccer, George. Your God isn't going to be this thing. My parents were good at that. And when we have someone who pours into us intentionally, we start to see the value, see the things modeled. They're not just telling us. There's moments where they can be like, hey, you need to pull your head out of your armpit and do this because that's dumb. And we're like, you're totally right. But usually, haven't they earned the right to say that to us? Like, not just anybody can say that to me. My wife can most of the time without me getting mad. But some people can't because they haven't earned the right. We earn the right by showing love and pouring into people's lives. Amen? So important, you guys. And then, we, and then when you do it, you hear stories. In my family, we would start to hear stories when we would spend time, and I was seeing it modeled, and my grandpa was pouring into my life. Both grandpas would share the stories of how God had come and radically changed them. They didn't just live life and, and, and keep that part of their story secret from me. My grandpa, was ra- on my mom's side, was radically saved in the Navy. He was going down a terrible road. He was addicted to stuff, and he wasn't the person he wanted to be. And there was a moment in his life where God showed up in, the, in a person. They gave him a Bible, he started reading it, and he read for the first time, it really hit him, that he didn't have to do things and act good so that God would love him. It was by God's grace that he got love. He didn't have to earn it, and it radically changed everything, and he all of a sudden quit the addiction he had, and he quit the, the tra- trajectory. He married my, great, my grandma, and then they had my mom, and now I'm around, and he's like, he's like, you need to know the great things that God has done. Remember, one of the things about this generation is they didn't remember the mighty things of the God of Israel. They didn't remember. They didn't know the stories. What stories are you telling with, with your family? What stories are you telling with your friends? Are you telling about the things that God has done in your life? Are you telling even the struggle, like I'm facing this thing and this awful thing happened? But you know what? There was still hope at the end of it. Are you sharing those stories? If we don't, we don't pass them on. The final thing I wanted to leave us with in this, in this story. In Moses and Joshua, there's the moment of crossing the Red Sea. Well, I shouldn't go over here. <laughs> and then there was the crossing of the Jordan. When Moses crossed the Red Sea, he had all these people come with him. I don't know how old Joshua was. He was probably really young. And there's a moment where God said, you take, you take Joshua and you train him. And he poured his life into him. And he showed him his priorities. He showed him how he did stuff. He showed him how, here's my mistakes. Man, if I could do it over again, this is what I would do. Isn't that cool? When he probably got angry, like my dad, he went and apologized to Joshua because they had a real relationship. And there's a moment where Moses' faith in the past couldn't just remain these stories or these things that, hey, we're just living in the past and what God did for us back in here. And so we just stay here in the desert, talking about these old stories, because that will get us nowhere. Your kids need to have their own faith. Other people need to have their own faith. We cannot just make them have our own faith. Did you know that? People don't just want to have you put the, your faith on them. They want faith. They want to have something that inspires them, that changes their life. People want God. I find people love Jesus but they don't want religion. They don't want boxes inhibiting them. They want to be able to experience it themselves. They want to be able to cross the river themselves. And that's what Moses did. He said, okay, you can do this. And one of the biggest things I think that Moses left with Joshua was saying, look, at, I believe in you. And God has told me he's going to do a work in you. And you, can ha- you have the faith to do this. Joshua, go do it. Go live your faith out. Be you. 
Don't be Moses. Don't be me. Be you and be the best you that God has created you to be. Go and step across the river. And, and there was a moment where Joshua faced his own body of water and he stepped across it. And um, I think it's really important to remember that there are different waters for different generations. There's different questions that are being asked by our parents and our grandparents than we're facing today. And their answers aren't always going to be the answer today. You guys with me on that? And the waters that they crossed with Moses were different than the waters that they crossed with Joshua. But it was the same God that parted the waters. It was the same God that broke into their lives. It was the same God that went before them and helped them take the land that they'd been promised. It helped them um, experience faith for themselves. And what I want you to have is faith for yourself. I want you to, to, to experience faith and know a God who's loving, who's not distant and far and uncaring and unreal and, and, and scary or whatever that you've, you've experienced. Or just this, this little pretty little pet that, the, that pastors have talked about. And if you're nice and if you do good things, you can make this pet do magical tricks for you and give you the life that you want and the family you want. And we, and we look at, I don't want you to have a faith that's like that. I want you to have a risky, strong, courageous faith that you can pass on to your kids and to your friends because they see it in you. They see that you're willing to do things that no one else is willing to do. You're willing to put your foot in the water and look stupid. Like, if God doesn't show up, you're going to look really dumb. Like, Joshua's going to look re- ridiculous as he walks into the water with these guys and says, all right, God's supposed to part it, and then God doesn't show up. I want us to have that kind of faith that we're willing to look stupid if God doesn't show up. You guys with me on that? I think that's the kind of faith that the future generations that will ask different questions and cross different sets of waters and have different problems and different issues, I think that's the kind of faith that that will carry them through because they won't forget God. They won't forget his stories. It'll be right in their life. And they're going to have someone that poured into them and said, you can do this. And you're going to do it better than me. I want you to do it better. Go for it. God is faithful. Follow him. Amen? I think this is crucial, you guys. Let's get the elephant out of the room. Let's start leading our families. Let's lead one another. And that leadership isn't pushing others down to push ourselves up. It's helping others follow with faith and step into the things God wants them to do. Here's my challenge. I want us maybe two or three times this week, let's turn off our phones for dinner. Let's turn off our phones for a period of a few hours and let's swap stories about what God has done in our life. Let's swap stories about struggles that have gone on in our life. When faith is hard, let's be real with one another. But in that way, let's start passing on what we have to others, and may they pass on to us what they have. May we inspire a generation to have faith that follows God anywhere. Let's pray. Jesus, we love you. We thank you. We want to follow you with everything we got. You're so good to us. Jesus, give us faith to follow you. Give us the ability to see that when we are disconnected and we are checked out, Lord, we were actually abandoning the leadership that you've asked us to lead in. We are letting others lead and we are letting other voices and forces that could actually be destructive, Lord. I pray that we would see it and that we would lead out of love, of hope, out of faith. We pray these things in your name. Amen. Want to stand with us? Let's just